Morning. I'd like to welcome you to the services of the First Baptist Church of El Paso. This morning, I'm going to pick up on a series I started a couple of weeks ago entitled Real Change. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture that talks about the difference that Jesus can make in our lives. I think it's a message that could be helpful to you and hopefully will give you the help that you need to be the person that God wants you to be. Thanks for worshiping with us today. So ladies, do you have a favorite fairy tale? You know, when you were growing up as a kid, was there a particular story that really sort of captured your imagination, like Sleeping Beauty, um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, The Little Mermaid? Of course, I can name all these because I raised four little girls, and so I've watched just about every fairy tale there is. I, when I do premarital counseling for young brides, I often ask them that question, I love it when their answer is that their favorite fairy tale was Beauty and the Beast, okay? So that, I really love that, you know, because that's perfect setup for the counseling because you do marry a beast when you get married, just in case you didn't know that. The thing about fairy tales, the f thing about fairy tales is I think most of us are drawn to the ending, okay? The, any good fairy tale has some drama, you know, there's some monster or something bad that happens and a hero comes along, but it's that last little line and they lived happily ever after. That's what we hope for. That's what we want. We want to live happily ever after. But you see, that's where the problem comes. For most of us, marriage and life doesn't turn out like a fairy tale. In fact, we often look at our lives and we wonder where where did we go wrong? What, what happened? Why, why aren't we living happily ever after? And then sometimes we, we come to church and we expect the Bible and our relationship with God to be like a fairy tale. And so, so we walk to the front of an auditorium, we pray a prayer, we get baptized, we, we make some commitment in our life. And we have this idea that when I pray that prayer when I get baptized, when I, whatever that event was that you were hoping was the turning point, you make that commitment and then you expect happily ever after. And it doesn't happen. Now don't get me wrong, I believe when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, something really huge does happen. In fact, Paul said, anyone that is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away and everything's become new. I totally believe that. I certainly agree with Jesus when Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you are born again, a brand new start, unless you are born again, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. But I think Jesus was really on target when he used the image of being born again. Those of you that have children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, you know that those little bitty babies that come into our lives and brighten up everything, they don't come ready to take care of themselves, do they? They need a mom and a dad and a grandmother, and they need all kinds of help because when they come to us as little bitty babies, it's a long way from the bassinet to the high school, isn't it? There's a lot of growing up and maturing that needs to happen. Could it be that that's what the Christian life is like? That when we accept Christ at that moment, something radical does happen. We are truly born again, but we also have begun a long journey to become who God wants us to be. A few weeks ago, we looked at Matthew chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 3, we're going to go back to that favorite of Baptist churches, John the Baptist. And we're going to look again at his ministry just to remind us some background on him. We're actually going to look at the first 12 verses, but the sermon today is primarily in verse 11. But I want you to be reminded of this great preacher John the Baptist. Now, if you know about John, you know that he was the forerunner of Jesus. In the entertainment industry, he would have been the opening act or the warm-up band. He was getting people ready for Jesus coming. In the ancient world, whenever the king was coming to town, they would send out 
heralds that would announce the king is coming and the whole town would get ready for his arrival. And so that's basically John's responsibility. So in verse 1 of chapter 3, it says, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come, has come near. This is who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord and make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People came out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think and say to yourselves, We are Abraham, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God could raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he, is, he will clear the threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn and burn up the chaff with an unquenchable fire. If John had a favorite word, it would have been the word repent. In fact, you see it as we read this text coming up, popping up time and time again. The word repent, you hear it sometimes at church. You don't hear it much anyplace else, but you hear it at church, and this is the idea that most of us think of, that when you repent, you turn around. You change the direction of your life. To repent means that you stop doing some things, you start doing other things. That's the way we often think of it. But when John used this particular word, John was using a word that meant, and the same word that Jesus used, to change the way you think. Jesus and John both agreed that if a person's life was going to radically change, that it started in what you thought and in what you believed. That's where real change begins. And so when John said repent, he was saying, you guys need to change the way you see yourself. You need to change the way you see the world. You need to change the way you see God. You need to revolutionize how you see reality. It starts in your mind and in your heart. Now, John, as he shares in verse 11, he says, I came baptizing in water or with water for repentance. John understood that if a person was going to have real change, that there had to be a moment in their life when they acknowledged that they needed to change and they asked for help. You see, if a person doesn't acknowledge they have a problem, it's practically impossible for them to change. In the recovery community, that's called denial. That someone lives in denial. To give a classic, I guess, entertainment illustration of someone who may be living in denial, it would be Justin Bieber. Many of you know that young pop star that many of our girl, teenage girls are just drooling over. Well, Justin Bieber, I think he's around 19 years old. In the course of about a week and a half, on the West Coast, police showed up at his house for egging his neighbor's multi-million dollar house. Now, I don't know whether Justin actually egged the neighbor's house, but he got accused of that. And so here he is, a 19-year-old kid throwing eggs at a guy's house, and the police show up. He flies to the other coast, and he gets arrested this time for drag racing a Lamborghini down a, a residential street under the influence of drugs and alcohol. So the next thing you know, you see Justin dressed in the garb of a jail. So here's this 19-year-old kid that has the whole world in front of him, and he's egging houses, and he's getting arrested for drag racing. One of the sad parts of the story is that his father actually was participating in the drag race. It actually was blocking off streets so his son could commit a crime. 
You see, Justin may feel like that he's doing the right thing, but most of us who understand how this world works, we know that he doesn't realize that he's on a path that leads to trouble. And God's clearly trying to get his attention like he tries for all of us, but is Justin going to realize it? Well, see, John believed that if a person was really going to change, then they needed to repent. They needed to acknowledge that they needed help and that they'd messed up. And that's what the baptism was about. He said, I baptize you in water. Now, John, like Baptist, he would get you really wet. In fact, you'd go down to the Jordan River, and the word baptizo literally means to plunge or immerse. And so John would take this person who knew they needed to change, and he would thrust them under the water, hold them under till they bubble like most Baptist preachers, and then they would come up soaking wet, and everybody that knew them saw them do that and knew that they really wanted to change. Okay? Now, but John understood that real change takes more than just realizing you need to change. In 1992, I had a package in the mail. My dad was here preaching last Sunday, and I'll, I'll never forget, in 1992, I received a book in the mail from my father, which is a rather unusual experience. He doesn't often send me books. In fact, he sent this book to all four of us boys. And so each one of us received this book. And in the book, I read it this morning. He had a little foreword in the book where he wrote, he said, I want you to read this. He said, there are principles in here that could change your life. Now, obviously, he believes in God's word, but the book he sent me, was Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now, if you've never read that book, I would recommend it. it it's an incredibly gift and powerful book. It has a lot of principles. In fact, I can still remember some of the lessons I learned. He taught to begin with the end in mind. In other words, before you start a journey, you need to know where you're going with your life. He talked about being proactive instead of reactive. He talked about seeking first to understand and then to be understood. He talked about the importance of sharpening the saw, that if you don't take time to sharpen your skills and, and rest and renew yourself, that you're not going to be as productive. There were all kinds of incredible things he taught. But there was one significant fatal flaw in the book, if you read it closely. Now, this is from a Christian perspective. Stephen Covey, as he gets to the end of his argument, he says that at the center of everyone's life, that we place something or someone in the center. And that most important person or thing basically defines all the reality of our life. In other words, the most important person or thing in my life may be my wife. And so if my wife is my life, then it determines how I spend my time. She determines how I spend my money. My relationship with her becomes everything to me. For others of us, it might be our children. It might be our career. It may be possessions that you basically live to accumulate all the toys, you know. He, you know, the guy that dies with the most toys wins. It's the philosophy some people have. And so he says, whatever is the center of your life determines everything. And then he makes this argument. He said, if you want to be successful and effective, he said, make timeless principles the center of your life. Timeless principles. In fact, he advocates a few of the principles that if you put these at the center of your life, everything will get better. Now, essentially what he offered the secular world is the same answer that you find in the Old Testament. What I mean by that is in the Old Testament, God gave us the principles by which to live our lives. You might call them the Ten Commandments. But you see, the fatal flaw is this. We have proven over thousands of years that the human being can know what to do and still not do it. The New Testament calls it your sinful nature. 
that down deep inside of us, we have a fundamental flaw in our character. And even when we know what to do, we still do not do it. You've been there. I'm not even going to talk about your promises you made to God that you've broken. How many times have you made a promise to yourself and you said, you know, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to say that again. I'm never going to eat that again or whatever it was. I'm not going to drink it, smoke it, whatever it was. You made that promise to yourself and you said, I'm going to stop. And you did for a little while, but then you couldn't. You see, what Covey wasn't taking into account is that all of us have this fundamental flaw in our character. And just knowing what to do is not enough. John the Baptist would say it like this, just admitting you have a problem and asking for help is not enough. You need someone who can give you the power to change. And that's why he said this. He said, I baptize you in verse 11 with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is, notice, more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He said, I know that you guys are serious about changing. I know that you want a new beginning in your life. I baptized you today because I'm, I desperately want you to be who God wants you to be. But he said, listen to me. There is someone who is coming that is more powerful than I am. In fact, if there was ever an understatement in the Bible, it was that one. You, John the Baptist, according to Jesus, was one of the greatest men that ever lived or walked on planet Earth. And John said, I'm not even worthy to be a common slave and carry his sandals. Jesus is so more powerful than I am that it is hard for me to even communicate to you what he could do in your life. But to make the point, he said this. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but notice what he says about Jesus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, this is the new, the new international translation. That word with, in Greek, it could easily be translated, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Just like we take someone into the baptistry and we lower them into the water and they're completely submerged and surrounded by the water. That's the image that John has, that Jesus will take us and he will submerge us and plunge us into the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. You see, the promise to change, the desire to change, to ask for help is wonderful, but what you need is God's Holy Spirit to be so part of who you are that he gives you the power to change. You say, well, I've heard about that. You see, there are those within the Christian community that when they talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this is basically the way they describe it. They say that you become a follower of Jesus, and then at some point, if you're really willing to go deeper, then you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're going to speak in tongues. And that mark of speaking in tongues will show that you have moved into the special forces, as it were, and that you are now an insider in the kingdom of heaven. Now, it makes sense in a way. I mean, there's some scriptures that they use to sort of make this argument. But it's rather clear in this passage that John believed that everyone who came to Jesus, not just the special, not just the dedicated, that everyone who came to Jesus, he would baptize them in the Holy Spirit. Every one of his children. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, Paul said that the Holy Spirit is like a deposit in your life to guarantee that God is going to save you. In other words, every single one of God's children receives the gift 
and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But what does it mean and how does it impact my life if the Holy Spirit comes into my heart? Well, if you have your Bibles open, if you'll just flip a few pages over to the book of John. In John chapter 14, Jesus explains this mystery to his disciples. Now, to set the stage, in John chapter 14, Jesus is getting his disciples ready for his death on the cross. Now, if there was anyone on earth that believed Jesus was powerful, it was the disciples. In fact, to a man, they believed he was the Son of God. Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You have the words of life. Who could we go to but you? So these men believed in Jesus completely, but Jesus knew the next day their minds were going to get blown because the Son of God was going to be crucified by a Roman ruler and the Son of God was going to die. What were they going to do? How, how could they handle that? And so what Jesus did was he began to pull back the curtain and say, this is what it's going to be like. And so in verse 15 of chapter 14 of John, he says, If you love me, keep my commands. Notice. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. Jesus said, guys, I want you to love me, and let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask the Father, and the Father is going to give you another advocate. Now, that's the word the international translation use. If you have an English standard, it says another helper. If you have the King James Version, it says another comforter. What's interesting is they're all right. Every one of those translations would be accurate because the Holy Spirit is an advocate. He is your helper and he is your comfort. The Greek word literally means to call somebody to your side. If you've ever been in a really bad place, maybe you're sitting in an emergency room, someone in your family has been deeply hurt, or maybe you, you've gotten bad news from a doctor, you stood beside a grave. You know the feeling of when someone who loves you comes and stands beside you and you know that in the middle of that dark time in your life that you're not alone, you know that feeling? That's what the Holy Spirit does. He comes and stands beside us. He, he helps us. He guides us. He's God's presence in our life. This week I was reading the book by Solomon Northrup. Yeah, recently there's a movie that came out called 12 Years a Slave. And in this story, it's a story about an African-American who was a free man in New York who was tricked and captured and sold into slavery. And the terrible journey of living in slavery is the story of this book. At one point in the story, Solomon, the slave was doing some kind of work around the plantation, and he made a mistake. And the master, Tibbets, goes berserk. He grabs the whip, and as he had done before, he fully intended to beat Solomon for his mistake. But Solomon, his mind just snapped, and he thought to himself, I'm not going to let this man beat me. And so Solomon was stronger and bigger than his master, and so they began to fight with each other, he took the bullwhip from his master and he beat his master until the master crawled away seeking help. Suddenly Solomon realized that he had made a horrible mistake. You see, he was nothing more than property and he suspected that if within a matter of moments he would die for beating his master. Sure enough, the master comes back with two big men and a rope. Solomon decides instead of fighting, to yield, hoping that they would have mercy on him. They tell him to put his hands behind his back, and he does, and they tie his hands, and then they tie his feet. And then they fashion a noose and slip it over his neck. At this point, the three men are debating, how are we going to hang him? 
They're looking for a tree that has a strong enough limb to hold him until he dies. As they're sitting there debating his death, Solomon turns and he sees Chapin come out of the great house. Chapin was the foreman over the slaves, and in his hand he held a gun. And he said, gentlemen, if you move that slave one foot, you're a dead man. And he stood there with the gun pointed at those men until they stepped back and walked away. Chapin was Solomon's advocate. When there was no way out and no way he could be rescued, Chapin stepped in and saved his life. That's who the Holy Spirit is. You see, you have enemies within you and outside of you that would love to destroy you. And there may be times that you feel as if your hands are tied and there is no way out of this. But the Holy Spirit is not going to turn loose of you. He will show up when you need him, and he will protect you and defend you and take care of you. He said, I'm going to send someone who will be with you. But look on the next page. If you look on chapter 16, beginning with verse 13, Jesus tells us something else about the Holy Spirit. Right, verse 13, he says, but when he, speaking of the spirit of truth, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Not only does the Holy Spirit defend us, comfort and help us, but Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth is the way he described it, he will guide you into all truth. That's another way of saying he will teach you. What Jesus is saying is that when I leave, I will give you the Holy Spirit, or as John the Baptist said, I'll baptize you in the Holy Spirit, and he will guide you into all truth. Now, don't miss the word truth. Because you see, at the heart of any compulsive, destructive sin or behavior is a lie. Satan is a liar, the father of lies, Jesus called him. And so if you buy into the lies, those lies will destroy you. And so the Holy Spirit does what? He guides you, he teaches you into all truth. Now, how does that play out? Well, the more you're in God's word the better you'll recognize his voice. So I'd encourage you to read God's word. But in addition to that, the Holy Spirit convicts you. You probably had this experience. You're facing a temptation or a choice. You've been here before. You've made the mistake in the past. And something inside of you says, don't do that. Don't go there. Don't make that choice. The Holy Spirit's trying to protect you. Now, the thing about the Holy Spirit is that he will whisper into your heart and mind, but you make the choice. Some of us have heard the Spirit warning us, and we still disobey. It's not that the Holy Spirit didn't try, we just didn't listen. And when we do that kind of thing, even though the Holy Spirit protects us, I think like any good parent, he's going to let you suffer some consequences. Now, he may not let it have his full effect on your life, but he may let you go through some hard times because you didn't listen. Because you see, he loves you. He's not an enabler that rescues you from your problems. He warns you and sometimes lets you suffer when you make a wrong choice. But he also, I think more often than not, he's actually the one that is suggesting what you should be doing. You see, too often we spend all of our time focusing on what we should stop doing, when if we would spend more energy on the things we should be doing, the things we shouldn't be doing would go away. So the Holy Spirit would be the one that, that might wake you up in the morning and say, why don't you get into God's Word? Or the Holy Spirit may be the one that as you're reading the scriptures, 
suddenly it makes sense, and it never made sense before. The Holy Spirit is the one that when you come into a place of worship like this, you think the preacher read your mail, and he knows what's going on in your life, when the reality is the Holy Spirit used a sentence, a word in a song, or something to speak right where you are. He guides us in all truth. But notice he says, the next phrase there, he will not speak on his own, he speaks only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. In other words, the Holy Spirit is out ahead of you, and if you listen to him, he will protect and watch over you. I skipped something a minute ago. Let me go back to chapter 14 if you want to flip back there. One last thought there. In chapter 14, verse 17, I accidentally skipped something. He says, the, word can, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. He says, but you know him, for he lives with you, and I love this part, and he will be in you. You see, the difference between following Jesus in the days of the disciples versus today is in the days of the disciples, Jesus was physically with them. And so for him to be with them, they camped out where he camped out. They had lunch where he had lunch. They went where he went. Today, because of the Holy Spirit, God goes wherever you go because he is where in you. So where did you take him this week? You know, that's a little scary, isn't it? You know, where did you go this week? What were you doing this week? Because wherever you went, he went because he's in you. And so that's why John said, if you truly want to change, then you need to have someone more powerful than me that can baptize you in the Holy Spirit. But then he added, and fire. Now what's up with that? Well, some scholars believe, and even in the text you hear this word fire come up over and over again, that what he's saying is that with Jesus there's no middle ground. You're either with him or against him. If you're with him, then he baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. If you're against him, then he baptizes you in fire, which would be a symbol of God's judgment. Going to hell would be another way of saying it. Now, interestingly enough, Jesus spoke about hell more than anybody else in all the Bible. That might shock many of us because we think of Jesus as being incredibly loving. But you see, if hell really does exist and you are incredibly loving, wouldn't you warn somebody to not go there? I think that's why Jesus talked about it. He didn't want anybody to end up there. But I personally don't think that's what John's referring to. I don't think he's talking about hell. I'm talk, I think John is talking about how Jesus builds our character. I call it the big C with my girls. How does God build character? Well, in, the, in those days, if you were going to purify gold or silver, what would you do? You would place it in the fire. If you were going to temper a sword for battle, you would, what? you would temper it in the fire. And what John was saying is that when Jesus gets a hold of you, not only will he give you the Holy Spirit, but Jesus will also baptize you in fire. There will be times in your life that he will put you in difficult places for the purpose of developing your character. The brother of Jesus said it like this in James chapter 1. He said it this way. He said, count it all joy when you fall into trials of many kinds because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance and let perseverance have its perfect work in you so that you can be complete and entire, lacking nothing. I've always thought that verse was odd because it says, count it all joy, celebrate, throw a party when you find yourself in all kinds of trials. The last time I found myself in a bunch of trouble, I was more prone to complain or beg God to get me out of it than to celebrate it. And you've been there. Like, God, if you love me, why am I in this situation? Why is this happening to me? 
James says, count it all joy when, when you fall into trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. He said, you know this. Think about it. The testing of your faith, being baptized in the fire, develops perseverance. That's a great word. It literally means to not give up and to not give in. That what God is trying to do is he's trying to raise a generation of children who do not give up and they do not give in. And the only way he can do that is to baptize us in the fire, to put us in situations that test us. He says, because we know the testing of our faith develops perseverance. And then he says, let perseverance have its perfect work in you. In other words, don't beg God to get out of the problem. Ask God to get you through it, to go through the valley of the shadow of death. He says, because when you get to the other side, you will be mature and complete and not lacking anything. Mature, complete, not lacking anything. If you grew up a Jew, you would have recognized those words. You see, when you went to the temple to offer a sacrifice, it was supposed to be mature and complete and not lacking anything. It was supposed to be without blemish. I think James was saying what God wants to do is to make his children just like Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth. And the only way he can do that is he has to put us through trials and difficulties and hard times to develop our character. You see, happily ever after is not exactly what you thought it would be, but I promise you when you get to the other side, you won't be the person that you used to be. And you'll be amazed at who you've become. So John said, I'm so glad you wanted to change. I'm so glad you asked for help. Let me introduce you to Jesus. He has the power to change you. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit, who will protect you, comfort, and guide you, who will guide you into all truth. And he will also put you in circumstances that will test you. Because he knows that in the end, you will become everything that God wants you to be. Let's bow for prayer together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the truth in your word. Lord, we are so grateful that you're more powerful than any preacher that has ever stepped behind a pulpit. That you have the power not only to tell us the truth, but you have the power to introduce us into the kind of relationship with you that will never be the same. Lord, forgive us for misunderstanding the work of your Holy Spirit. Forgive us for not realizing that he truly is a person who's been sent to be our advocate, our comforter, and our help. Teach us to listen to his voice when he speaks. And Lord, if today we find ourselves in a difficult place, if we're going through a trial that is testing our faith, Lord, may our faith produce perseverance. Help us to not give up and to not give in so that we can become all that you want us to be. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we close our time together, if you remember, I talked about the fact that knowing the right thing to do is not necessarily all that we need because most of us know what we ought to do and oftentimes fail to do it. John the Baptist says that Jesus has the power to give us the help that we need to be the people we are meant to be, that that power comes through what Jesus calls the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit becomes part of our everyday life and where he tests us with fire. If you find yourself today desperately wanting to change, I would strongly encourage you to put your faith and trust in Jesus. Ask him to come into your life. And the moment he does, the Holy Spirit of God will become your constant companion, your helper, and your friend. 
If you've already made that commitment, you may be in one of those difficult times where God's building your character. But even then, I would encourage you not to try to get out of the problem, but to ask God to get you through it, to trust Him and to give you the strength you need. Either way, the bottom line is that we need to trust in the Lord. And so that's our hope for you today, that you'll put your faith and trust in Jesus. Thanks for watching today. We hope to see you again next week.